Then the last presentation of this morning uh, will actually be a uh, co-presentation of the two uh, topic owners of the uh, uh, Light for Health and Wellbeing uh, topic. Um, this uh, Professor de Kort and uh, Dr. Menting. Yvonne de Kort obtained her PhD in environmental psychology at the uh, Eindhoven University of Technology in 1999. She stayed at this university first and as associate professor and later as a uh, full professor since 2015. Uh, she has been co-director of the Game Experience Lab for six years, but uh, in the last year, so mainly since 2011, her main focus of research is on the effect of light uh, for uh, humans and then in various uh, contexts. And in 2011, she became the program leader of the ILI program on uh, sound lighting. And Dr. Schurt Menting uh, currently is an uh, innovation manager at the uh, Philips Lighting Research. He obtained his PhD in uh, physics uh, at the University of Leiden in uh, 1994 and then worked for two years as a postdoc in Toronto. I'm also looking at him to check whether that's right what I'm saying. Um, he, he's, uh, he's joined uh, Philips at uh, 1996. He has been working in uh, Philips research in different functions and uh, during the last uh, years he is uh, mainly focusing on uh, uh, program uh, management and uh, innovation in the area of the impact of light on uh, humans and plants. And uh, they both will give their view on how you can use light to uh, manipulate uh, crowds. And from the setup, I guess that short is going to start. Well, the physicist and environmental psychologist binds is uh, a vision. It's a shared vision what lighting will bring. We are after creating 24-7 meaningful lighting solutions to this world. That's our ambition. And another thing that binds us, and I think I'll just cut the grass a bit uh, for you, is a whole bunch of fantastic PhD students and master students to create this topic for us. And why don't we ask them to stand up now? Because, right, uh, they will also present the posters later on. So everybody who's in the sound lighting program and the Light for Health and Wellbeing program in lighting research, yeah. What a fantastic crowd. And you also see a slight bias towards a certain part of the population. <laughs> which uh, some people may envy. Um, and I will show you briefly that Light for health and well-being, sound lighting, understanding what light means to people is also today. The future is today. And um, because um, uh, uh, we have done a truckload of experiments in the laboratory, in sleep laboratories, and where have you, uh, but now suddenly, as Case explained, uh, we are going to create platforms. This knowledge is getting out of the lab and it's getting into context. It's going into our office in the new Atlas building. But the next platform is the whole city. So we can only bring 24-7 meaningful lighting solutions to this world if we move from the lab to these platforms, be it lighting systems, and only we can make it meaningful if we get the data back from how people behave, how they respond, and how people can actually interact with those systems. So my goodness, what an agenda is that ahead of us? But at least uh, we are already somewhere, and I hope this can start. And certainly Yvonne is not an assistant. It's, <laughs> it's actually the other way around often. Um, so she will try to start a video that explains that we're actually in the marketplace if it works, nope. it's not working. Again, it's not working. It's not working. That is not a problem. You just go to the next slide. <laughs> Sorry. Not much of an assistant. What the video showed, and I can do uh, one, one minute 20 in 20 seconds easily by talking, because uh, human-centric lighting is lighting that is relevant to you and to you and to me at a certain moment in time in a certain context. And what we have recently launched in the world is, uh, say, the second generation of what we call tunable white solutions uh, for offices, for healthcare, for home. And um, um, uh, uh, those, those, um, those solutions, uh, uh, they are based on the benefits that we have explored in the lab. So what kind of intensity and color temperature do you actually need to wake up? The wake-up lamp is already a 10-year-old uh, thing. Um, uh, but then, of course, when you go into the bathroom or to the, or to the kitchen or the living room, 
to, make, to start your day, yeah, that can only be done with intelligent systems that actually tune color and intensity. And the same if you go to your office and you're over 45, your eyes start deteriorating and you need a bit more light to do your work properly. So these solutions are now hitting the market and if you read the news, the lighting, uh, the LED magazine or something, um, uh, all the companies in lighting are now jumping on this new value of light. This is the Philips human centric lighting vision and definition because this definitely goes beyond uh, creating another bulb, how difficult that can still be, uh, Wilbert, absolutely. Um, but this is about creating additional value based on uh, uh, the evidence that we create in terms of vision, well-being and performance of people. And what that does, not only to me personally, but also to this audience or to an institute like the TU uh, uh, Eindhoven, is to increase the overall performance of such an institute, as measured by many parameters that could be loyalty of our, of our people to the institution, actually. Are we actually leaving the institution, yes or no? Yeah? If we create a fantastic workplace, no, of course we won't. Of course we won't. Just as an example of how to do this. Now, um, in the program, Sound Lighting and Light for Health and Wellbeing, uh, the prime uh, emphasis uh, so far has been on indoor applications, primarily because this external platform, Cities, has not yet truly been available. So that's going to change. But um, uh, uh, there is still three key focus areas that are both in focus of the TU and of uh, Philips is to move up in value in the workplace. Um, yes, uh, Tanir, we need to optimize, uh, uh, where is Tanir? We need to optimize uh, energy still, because that is directly related to, uh, to reduced uh, cost and very measurable. Yes, we need to do that. Uh, but also, we need to optimize space. So I guess in the Atlas building, there's more people going to work than there have been before, right? So how to do that properly? We have to optimize that space, and actually the money that is involved in uh, space is about 10 times higher than there is in the use of the energy of the building. And then there's us as employees, because we want to earn a living, and there's about 10 times more, again, money involved. And these are US uh, 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 numbers, they're in dollars and square feet. Um, there's again 10 times more money involved in uh, us and, and, and if indeed uh, people are sick, they cost about 2,000 uh, euros on average per year. That's sort of the numbers that are floating around. So how to actually capture part of that value? That is one of the big, big challenges ahead of us. Um, and other focus areas, and then we come closer to the topic of today also, is, it, is, is one of these big trends also in this world that, 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 uh, that mental health is becoming a more and more serious issue also because of the aging population. And bringing, uh, and the, the pressures on the healthcare system in, in institutions also brings the whole trend of creating homes, living spaces that are conducive to health, maintaining healthy and independent living. So these three main thrusts for our program will carry an agenda for the years to come. Uh, but the video was showing that we're actually hitting the market with quite a few products. That means that we're quite confident to actually move our research out into the open. And uh, let's then uh, go to the next one and uh, maybe not uh, challenge uh, fate uh, to play this one. Uh, but we might. We try. might. Yeah. He might, you never know. But I can tell you through the PSV story. So I'm an Android person and she's an uh, Apple person. And I think that is where things, still interoperability issues uh, play a role. Case you know what is happening? No, no, no it, it's not about showing movies. That's not the point. Because, yeah, um, uh, they're all on the internet, internet and you can, you can see them. But what we can do in stadiums already today, and who has been uh, um, um, uh, experiencing the Arena Vision solution in the PSV stadium? You see, there's quite a few, but it still means that there's a few people who need to. Uh, we know how lighting can create experiences. These Arena Vision systems, they're so clever now that they can sync with the music and with uh, uh, disco shows and uh, even with, uh, oh my goodness, what's the name of the guy? Uh, the singer from Tilburg. <laughs> 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 
mate. Everybody has been there, right? Guus. Everybody Guus has been mate. to Guus, I think. Yeah. But, so this is about light shows. Um, and yes, creating fantastic experience in stadiums is essential to draw people to these stadiums. But that's only half the story. The other half of the story is that actually, actually for stadium owners, um, safety is the number one issue. Because with 50,000 people in that pitch and something is happening, uh, 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 such a stadium owner it has a serious uh, issue. Uh, uh, for instance, with not even being able to uh, ensure such a, such a liability. So, safety in stadiums is a key issue. And we have a few handles, but we don't really know how to address this. So one of them is the question, can we, by adding light experiences, uh, already make the, the mood of people such that they're much less likely to start hitting on each other or fall over each other when they have to evacuate? But on the other side, especially in the States with bad weather uh, or hurricanes or, or indeed with uh, maybe even more adverse events, uh, evacuation scenarios are, uh, are critical to understand and to promote an easy um, a way for people to exit the, 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 the building. Now, uh, my last slide is, is this one where obviously one of our big next challenges is to understand the effect of people uh, of light on crowds. So not in the lab, not with an individual, not in the office space with about six or 10 or 25 people. It's all very difficult. Uh, but the next thing is yet another layer of complexity with many people in a very complex uh, setting. And um, uh, one of the ways this is done is through modeling uh, in the virtual world with characters like in games that have a, have a certain uh, behavior. And all these models that are actually being used in creating the scenarios for evacuation, but also during operation of the stadium to choose, shall we, go, shall we do this, shall we do that, where to put the guard, which door to open, etc. Uh, these models are highly sophisticated, but lighting is not part of it. So, and that means that we have an agenda here in front of us to bring light into these scenarios and to influence some of these parameters that are being measured by stadium owners, um, uh, like density of people, like evacuation times, and how does that actually work? The, and, 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 and how we can relate to these kind of key performance indicators of stadiums is through the effect of light on people. And that is where psychology comes in. There is where the effects of light on anxiety of people come in, and that's where Yvonne comes in. Yvonne. Thank you. No, <laughs> Thank you. I realize I'm the only thing standing in between you and lunch, so I'll try to keep this brief. Um, but this is an exciting new field that we're working on, and uh, uh, we have to be honest here. We have to acknowledge that we're taking the first baby steps. This is a vision, this is a roadmap that we're presenting here. Um, so we're looking ahead, not looking backwards. Um, that would be nice. So, You've heard this, uh, lighting beyond lighting, lighting beyond mere visibility and general sense of safety. That would be nice. Now we're, as I said, we're starting this new vision, we're starting this new uh, uh, research program, but we're not starting from scratch. We have had several relevant pro uh, projects in our program. For instance, the IELTS project, uh, with Leon van Rijsdijk as a PhD student and Antal as a, as a co-promoter. And that was very much about investigating the influence of, uh, or the relationship between lighting and feeling safe somewhere. Um, we know that light is very important for feeling safe. We learned a lot about this relationship, and in fact, that is not as direct as you would perhaps expect. We learned that concepts such as prospect, being able to see where you're headed, entrapment or escape possibilities, and concealment are key variables, and we have to fit our lighting so that they accommodate for this. And we also learned that there is a key role for anxiety, that anxiety, whether it's trait anxiety or whether it's state anxiety, is crucial in your feelings of uh, f uh, uh, safety. Another project that we did, this is not behaving well, 
that we're still doing, in fact, is the de-escalate project. You may have also heard from this. What we're trying to do currently is, uh, uh, both in mental health care institutions and in Stratums Eind, trying to use light uh, scenarios to defuse uh, aggressive events or potentially aggressive events. And actually, what we're learning is uh, several things. Um, one is, uh, my, that's difficult. <laughs> it's difficult because we're, we were starting from scratch and developing those scenarios, but also doing research in the real world, trying to capture the mood of a crowd as big as the crowd on Stratum's Eind on a Saturday evening. That's really tricky, and we don't have, we didn't have the tools just yet. We're developing those tools, and in fact, um, the um, PhD student working on the street is uh, is now uh, developing more focused on developing methodologies for studying crowd behavior than uh, actually investigating the effect of the light scenarios. But we have learned a lot about looking at crowds, understanding crowds, understanding their moods. And, uh, and we learned a lot also about the meaning of light. And the meaning of light is important. Light is, beyond giving us, showing us the world, is sending us information that we're processing most of it unconsciously. And um, so, so, for instance, you may have seen this in, a, in a earlier presentations. Uh, the, the strongest example is, for instance, that the color white, uh, in comparison to the color black, has very important meaning. You will see that the good person in a movie is often dressed in white or wearing a white hat, whereas the back, the Lone Ranger, yes, the day before yesterday, I said, white hat. Um, and the bad guy is wearing black or a black hat. This is a meaning that has nothing to do with color, of course, but we have learned to associate this. So it's a very strong association that we have, and it comes up unconsciously. Importantly, this also uh, is, is uh, uh, present for light under certain circumstances, and Anna Schietekat can tell you a lot about this. But um, uh, the most important thing is that we see that these, um, uh, these, this meaning of light transfers to our perception of people. So in light settings, we perceive a person as more friendly and more positive than in darker settings, even if it's the same person. And uh, we had already in earlier student projects um, in the, uh, found that in warmer light settings, people perceive the very same picture of a social ambiguous situation in a very different way. In one, there's a happy couple on a couch and something, a noise appears, and in the other one, people interpret the scene. Just the only thing that happens is, that changes is the, the, the coolness of the light. They, they're in a fight. And we saw the same thing happening for people exiting a house. One was boy is saying goodbye to the girl, and the other one, boy is kicking the girl out of his house. So, so there are quite extreme examples of how we can interpret scenes differently when they're in a different light. So this meaning of light is very important. What we're also learning is that if you then change this into dynamic scenarios that you would need for long-term use, it all becomes a lot more complex. But uh, we luckily still have Anna and Indre uh, to solve these issues for us. Um, so now we have this new ambition to investigate the viability of light as a cue for emergency aggress. Um, and the first thing you have to realize is that if there is such an emergency aggress situation, there's often anxiety and panic. Um, and uh, uh, what you will also see is that because we're dealing with people, uh, uh, situations with lots of people, uh, those are typically in places, happening in places where you're not on a daily basis, you don't know all the exits, the only exit you know is the one that you came in through. Um, so there's reduced spatial orientation, perhaps people are also using certain substances like alcohol or drugs. Because of the, the uh, panic, because of the amount of people, there's a loss of overview and a feeling of loss of control. And this is a very uh, uh, unfriendly situation to be in. And, uh, and the big question is, how do people then act? How do, they start, how do they develop a plan and decide which way to run or walk quietly? So there's a bomb in the stadium, please leave quietly. Um, uh, that's not going to happen, of course. So, but, but then how do we decide what to do in these situations of panic? And, uh, and uh, a little overview. Well, first there is a state of anxiety, of course. And then what needs to happen is that you have to 
perceive your situation, the situation that you're in, take in this information, interpret the information, from this develop what are your um, uh, alternative strategies of behavior. I can go left, I can go right, I can up, go down, right? Make a decision and then aggress and continue your aggress until you are in a safe place. Now, importantly, uh, as psychology, if you look at the psychological literature, anxiety has a strong influence on each of these uh, phases, each of these processes. Anxiety influences how we perceive a situation. It influences which cues we utilize and which we ignore. It, it influences the way we make decisions and it influences the way we walk, uh, even. So this is a very strong factor, this anxiety. Importantly, from, for instance, the Deescalate project and all sorts of related projects with students, we are beginning to learn how we can use light to perhaps manage that anxiety, to perhaps lower anxiety a little bit. Uh, we have to be realistic. We're not going to make people nice and quiet if they're in a real panic, but we can do something, perhaps. So that's what we've been learning, for instance, in the Deescalate project. But we also have to develop... Ah, I have to stay really close here. Um, we also know a lot about perception. For instance, uh, Ingrid Vogels and her group and Ingrid Heinrich also have done already a lot of work on perception and how light influences perception. Now, what we have to now develop from new is how this changes under anxiety, under pressure, under time pressure, under emotional stress. And we know, for instance, from literature that the contrasts that we trigger on are different. We, we, con we focus more on um, uh, a visual co uh, contrast with a higher spatial frequency. We tend more towards bright than towards less bright. Um, uh, but there may also be an influence of how well we, uh, how fast we trigger on, on, for instance, flickering signs. So these are all, we have the basics. We have the methodologies in-house to do this research, but we have never before studied how anxiety uh, plays into this process, uh, except that we know that it will play an important role. Second, we also know from the IELTS project, for instance, the work from Leon and Antal, that um, we use certain cues and we can do this in a really, really fast mode. We use certain cues from the environment uh, to interpret the scene and give it a safe or non-safe uh, label. So we have to, and that's exactly what you have to do, of course, if you have to aggress from a busy stadium, you have to decide, is that safe, is that safe, which is the safest route to go. Now, we know already which type of cues we, uh, people are using. We know approximately we're beginning to learn where people are looking and how light factors into this. But again, we have not done this under uh, anxiety. At least we haven't manipulated it. We have tried to make people a little bit scared. So we try to get more females into our studies than males because they're more likely to be a little bit anxious. And we've put them out on the street, uh, try to not to stay too close to them, but of course, the experiments that we've been doing on campus, people knew that they were on campus, that there was an experimenter with them, and that nothing really bad was going to happen to them. And so we know under these conditions which cues people are using and how light impacts on this cue utilization, but we don't know how this would work if they're really anxious. So our next challenge is to get people really scared in the lab, <laughs> In the, uh, which is, uh, but that's amazingly difficult, as quite a number of students of mine know. And um, so we have to get them really scared or under some kind of emotional stress. And, uh, uh, and eventually we'll have to go out to the street. Um, so then there's decision making. And of course, we also have in our uh, group, particularly, a lot of expertise on decision making. And we know that. For instance, when you're in a state of anxiety, again, you will, your decision-making is different. It's, it's impaired, I can say. What you normally do if you're in a quiet, positive mindset, relaxed mindset, you will weigh all the different alternatives and choose the best one. If you're in a state of a high arousal and panic, you will only see a couple of those alternatives, 
and start making a decision before you've actually contemplated all the options. And you may not choose the best option. So we have to make sure that people see the safest options first, because they will not go around looking for everything. Luckily, we know from earlier research that, for instance, if you compare the um, uh, uh, welcoming signal from a light hallway versus a broad, a wide hallway, people will choose a light one. So light is very important in this, but exactly how we make sure that under panic, um, people will choose, will see those, at least those, those most safe options and how we can make them uh, uh, jump out, uh, we don't know just yet. And when I don't know whether, I, I'm not exactly sure whether light impacts on decision making, it does impact interpretation, so it will also, I assume, uh, affect decision making. And then, of course, there's regress. Once people are actually moving in a certain direction, you may want to manage, we don't say crowd control, we say crowd management or crowd manipulation, I just heard. Crowd management is a nicer word. Um, can we manage how fast people walk? Can we nudge them into a certain direction? It feels like it's, it's kind of an intuitive uh, uh, a feeling perhaps that we, that we should be able to do this. But we haven't really tried just yet until this weekend when um, this installation... Who's been at Glow Science? Good, but not good for the other ones. Please go tonight if you can. Um, because it's really good, it's really exciting, and there's, uh, there's at least three installations where Ilya is involved, and this is one of them. This is an installation in the market hall that uh, was also discussed uh, before. And um, uh, you can see that it's uh, uh, important people here are Philip Ross, uh, Alessandro Cobetta, Antal Hans. I have to admit, I don't know Pinaki Kumar, and lots of students. Um, and they have set up, in a really short time, a mass crowd experiment. What we have in the market hall is an intelligent lighting system that we can manipulate and have produced uh, dynamic uh, lighting scenes. And what they have now put up is um, a, a system that tracks people, computes their, computes the number of people that are there, computes the speed at which they are walking and the direction at which they're walking, and processes this data real time. So you can actually see uh, uh, how fast you have been walking and did the people are, that are with you have been walking. And you can also see what we're secretly doing is changing the light scene every couple of minutes. And then we can see on the screen real time which of those light scenes are creating the higher speed among the crowd. So um, I was there on Saturday, which was the first night of GLOW, and the counter was already uh, over the 60,000 people. So uh, this is a, the biggest study we have been involved in so far. So this is what's happening. This is one of those light scenes. And uh, as people are walking there, there are 12, I think, 12 connects uh, uh, tracking them. They're integrated, their images are integrated into one picture where we can really see exact distances, interpersonal distances, speeds and directions. And uh, uh, so this is exciting and this is something that we will have to be able to do also in this type of research. And now this is happening in a living lab. Of course, it's impossible to, to do something really important in this field without considering that all of this happens in a context, in a context of lots of different people. I'm not the only one making a decision. The people that, I'm, that are around me are also taking decisions. And my impost, most important guidance for choosing a direction is probably what those other people are doing, um, because we're social animals. The physical layout of the space will matter. The sound that is there, is there smoke? Is there... So you have to do, consider all of this in context, of course. So we will need more special tools uh, but luckily we have already been developing. So we will continue to do lab research also in this field. We can study nicely how people uh, are more or less sensitive to certain contrast in the lab and we can also make them a little bit scared there. Um, but we're also going to be using living labs like the Market Hall and like luck, uh, we ha we'll have in the city of Eindhoven. 
Then there's virtual reality. And virtual reality is going to be crucial in this because you can actually study actual behavior. And what research is showing is that the results from this are a lot more uh, reliable than the ones, or valid, I should say, than the ones coming from simulations. Because simulations are only as good as the model of the human behavior. And if we don't understand exactly how people make decisions, we cannot improve those models. So that's exactly what we have to do. And virtual reality is an important tool uh, that we are already using, that we will be using even more. And then, of course, there's real world, which involves reality mining, lots of data analytics, lots of uh, sensors, lots of cameras. So, um, sorry for taking a few minutes too, too many, but um, in short, this is our agenda for this new topic that we have. We have our various disciplines, and we start from quite fundamental work, take this to living labs, take this to controlled environments or to ecologically valid research environments such as virtual reality, and then take this to the real world, combining different tools and different disciplines to eventually develop true intelligent lighting, as we have already been doing, for instance, also in office work and in mental uh, health. Sorry, we cannot tell you everything. With more than 20 PhD students in our program, that would be impossible. I would take all day. Um, I hope you have enjoyed this, and I wish you a very nice lunch and uh, remainder of the day. Thank you. Thank you.